All right, today, uh, taking this lovely psalm, we are going to have six points and then six applications. So let's see how we do. Uh, chapter 22 here is so good that the Lord decided to repeat it, and it shows up twice in the Bible here. And then this is also, with minor variations, Psalm 18 is this joint right here. So rowdy enough for a double take and worthy of a, a double passage. This is uh, not just an ordinary psalm. There's times in David's life he goes through something, he writes a psalm. The psalms leave notes about that. But this one is at the end. This is at the end of his days, after he's been delivered from all his enemies. It's then that he sings this song. So this is an umbrella reflection on his whole life here. So it's pretty rowdy. Uh, just to get started here in the first verse, um, tells us that he directed these words to the Lord. So this was something of, this was an act of worship for David, even though he's speaking to everyone who hears him and he's speaking about the Lord. He's speaking to God, though. So this is a way of David giving thanks back to the Lord for everything he gave to him. And he thanks God by telling the Lord about all the stuff he did for him and by speaking about God to God as a blessing in that as well. He was delivered from all his enemies, but especially his chief arch nemesis, Saul. And that's, he's mentioned there too. So perhaps this is a psalm David sang over and over throughout all his deliverances. All right, so the six points we're going to have. So we'll have the intro. We'll have David's call to God. We will have God's answer uh, expressed metaphorically. Then we will have why God answers David. Then we will have God's answer literally and how he literally helped David. And then there'll be an outro. So first, intro, verses 2 through 4. Uh, he summarizes what this whole joint is going to be about. The Lord is his everything. Rock, fortress, deliverer, refuge, shield, horn of salvation, stronghold, savior. God is everything to David. He's the rock under his feet. He's the fortress over his head. He is the shield at his side. So David is protected from all angles and directions. God is his everything. David doesn't have two saviors or two deliverers or three that help him. There's only one. That is David's trust. And that's God. And he summarizes really what it's all about in verse 4. And this, this is not just a summary of David's battles. It's a summary of David's life. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. As we're going to see, this is the description of the Christian life. This is what the Christian can say all their days and at the end of their days, every believer will say the same thing. I call upon the Lord and I am saved from my enemies. Kings back in this time, it was all about pride. and So an ancient king, if he had destroyed all his enemies and brought peace, he would be exalting himself. This is what I did. From my own strength and my own wisdom, I made this. And I forged this kingdom and I conquered my enemies. David's totally different. He knows his weakness and apart from God, he can do nothing. He says again and again that his enemies, they're too strong for him. He's not strong enough. What makes David separate is that he trusts God. And that's true of us as well. That's what makes a Christian. Someone who knows that there's nothing they can do to save themselves, to fight their true enemies, their sins, and Satan and his foes. Nothing we can do in that realm. And so we must lean upon the Lord. Amen. Okay, that's the intro. Second here, David's call. So verses 5 through 7. This is the, the plot or what sets the scene. David is encompassed all around by death and destruction. He's being sought by his enemies. And it's not a metaphor here. They're really trying to kill him. Saul is trying to kill young David. David who loves Saul, faithful to Saul. Saul's trying to kill him. And there's much more enemies that unfold during the life of David, as we've seen over the epic of the story. And all these guys wanted to kill David. They wanted to put his head on a spike. They wanted to destroy him and, and set his body in public display for their victory over him and his God. And so David was the target 
of the enemies of God's people. And he says, not only was it all around me, but it entangled me and encompassed me. Verse 6. So he was, he was at the precipice of death. He was one step away from death. He's always escaping by the skin of his teeth here. Again, it's not pretty. You look at the life of David, you think, he must have been feeling pretty good and winning all those battles. For him, it wasn't like that. For him, he was almost dying all the time. And it was just barely the Lord got him out of there. I think that's encouraging also for the Christian life. The Christian life is not the life of great outward victory. It's the life where God saves us, right, in the nick of time, through every trial, one after another. That's the normal Christian life, where we feel discouraged, and we feel like it's over, and we feel that God's forsaken us, and we feel like we're alone, and then He comes through, right, right in the last second. He loves doing that, so it's no different for David. This is, he, he knows this was his whole life. So he's, in, he's, he, he's confronted by this. He's in need and distress. And so what does he do? He calls upon the Lord. That's what he does. He doesn't uh, rely on himself. He doesn't say, I, I just trained as hard as I could and, and studied Sun Tzu, Art of War, and I memorized that joint, and I know exactly what to do. He didn't do that. He says, I, did one, I called upon the Lord. That's what I did. In my distress, I called to my God. He's my God. He's loyal to me. He's my helper. He's my Savior. So I called on him. And he heard me. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came into his ears. Now that's amazing. You know, uh, it, you try to get someone's attention, or like in social media, you know, on Twitter and stuff, you got celebrities that are out there, you can try to get their attention, send them a good meme, drop a good one-liner, try to, you can never do it, right? You can never get your voice in their ears or the tweet in their eyes, you know? <laughs> But for the Christian, it's the most amazing thing. We have direct access to God. And it's not just for the Christian. It's for those who aren't Christians. And the Lord calls. You call upon the Lord truly from the heart, truly in faith, truly asking God to save you. And that voice goes right in his ears. And he hears. When we pray, we're not just praying to the air or the sky. There is a God who bottles up our prayers. And answers every one in his perfect timing and in his perfect way. David knew this. Okay, so that's David's call. I know, we're just cruising through it. I got no choice. Third section, God's answer, metaphorical. This is verses 8 through 20. What happened when David prayed, he says, is the earth reeled and rocked. It's basically earthquakes, volcanoes, dragons flying from heaven. And the Lord delivering him in miraculous, wondrous ways. As he describes this, it's, um, it's, this section is pretty much like, no, this didn't literally happen, okay? When David's fighting in battle, or Saul's seeking his life, and he's in a pinch, he's not calling to the Lord, and then the earth, there's literally an earthquake when he gets done praying, and then fire is shooting out from heaven, and God appears to him riding forth in victory. It didn't happen literally like this. It's meta this is metaphorical. Later, he's going to tell us what actually happened. But this, doesn't, this is not untrue. In reality, this is what God did, spiritually, invisibly, behind the scenes. This is how God moved for David. And what he says, basically, is, God moved the earth for me. He moved the earth. He struck down to the foundations. He undid the pathways of the seas. It's like, to save me... Just this one guy, this David that he delights in, he was willing to peel back all of creation and undo the thing just to deliver his guy. That's amazing. It's like a mythology here, almost, the way he describes the Lord. Smoke coming out of his nostrils and fire flashing forth from his mouth. He's like, he's like a dragon, you know? In his fury and in his anger, God was roused. So David feels alone, helpless, can't do anything for himself, but there's somebody that cares. Somebody that cares enough to get heated about it, his God. That's encouraging. When you're in that pinch, and you're dealt injustices, or you're up against temptations, or enemies of sin that you can't beat, or a situation or a trial that is too strong for you, when you call upon the Lord, he cares. He doesn't just hear. He's feeling that. He cares more than anyone else possibly could about what we go through. He cares more than we do. 
And so God responded to David's prayer in anger and fury against his enemies. He came down, and it was time to get rowdy. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. So earthquake, fire, brimstone. It's like, again, the volcano is shaking the earth and producing all these things, and darkness and storm is coming down from heaven. Uh, verse 11 is, is really raw. He rode on a cherub and flew. So when God's saying, you know, cherub, the mighty, uh, the uh, guardian angels, you know, kind of like a griffin type joint, um, mighty. And uh, it says he flew on him. So when David's thinking about the Lord, obviously God has no body. God is invisible. God has no size or shape. He is everywhere at once and yet fills all things at the same time. But when David's thinking of the way that God saved him, he's thinking about him in human form that he was localized there, riding forth from heaven upon a cherub. That's, that's the ill whip right there. There's nothing, nothing like that. Uh, that's, you know, it's like God's UFO. Um, so even in that, we see there, there's a re revelation of Christ there. David understood that when God saved him, he saved him ultimately in human form, in localized form. That's how God has delivered us. The true and living, invisible, infinite God has taken on human form and rode down on a cherub, as it were, and delivered us in his own body, in his own life. And we're going to even reflect on that at the table. So it's amazing. Uh, all this stuff, it didn't literally happen, but it happened. This was the manner in which God responded to David's prayer. And it doesn't always feel like that in our lives when we pray to God and we're alone. And it seems like he's doing nothing. But he is. We'll get into that in the applications. Um, yeah, it's rowdy. I mean, you could park on any one of these verses. So, you know, you got to give me mercy on this. We just got to keep it moving. Um, he brings David out. David pictures himself like he's drowning here. He's not literally in the water, but it's like that. It's like he's thrown into that primordial chaos of the sea covering the earth or the flood of Noah where it's only death and destruction and no order there's no up or down or he's in that place and God comes and secures him and draws him out of that and he puts his feet on solid ground and brings him out into a broad place uh, he does this for a reason. So this is our next point. So that was God's answer metaphorical. Now David, before David gets into what God's answer literally was, what it literally looked like, he pauses to reflect on why God even listened to him in the first place. And this is, uh, this is these verses, um, this is 21 through 28. These are, have been a head-scratcher for theologians. Scholars are divided, of course. It's, but I think the answer is pretty simple. So he says that God delivers him he leads into this in verse 20 because he delighted in him. We know that's what the name of David means, that God delights or he's be is his beloved. And so that's why God delivers him. But look what David says in verse 21. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness and according to the cleanness of my hands he rewarded me. Why would, why do you think that some people w w would have difficulty understanding this? Well, I mean, if you just open up to chapter 22 without reading any of David's life, maybe it would make sense. But is, are we talking about the same David? The David who fell into grievous sin? David's hands aren't clean. David is not a righteous man, not ultimately. He's fallen into horrendous sin. His sin is so bad that it's following his family all the days of his life and will ultimately tear the whole nation apart. So what does David mean here? Is this works righteousness? Does David think the only reason God saved him is because he's perfect? I don't think that's what David means at all. David knows he's a sinner. David wrote Psalm 18 here. He also wrote Psalm 51. He knows that he's a sinner. I think what David means is something more specific here, is that in his battles with these enemies, he did mean well. So like Saul. Saul wants to kill David. And David is not only um, running from Saul, but he's protecting Saul. He's trying to reason with Saul. He has opportunities to kill Saul, but he doesn't do it. 
because he's trying to serve God's anointed. So, um, in that way, David's hands were clean when it came to Saul. And with the other enemies, he knew God had appointed him to be the king of Judah, the king of Israel, and to subdue these nations. These were wicked, evil peoples that fought against the true and living God. So in those causes, David was righteous. David's no fool. He knows it's not because he's actually sinless or anything like that. But within those struggles, David had his head on straight. And there's something to be said about that. We'll talk about that in the applications too. And I think that's really what David means here. And of course, all these things are fulfilled in Christ. We'll talk about that as well in the, the righteousness. Uh, next section, God's answer literally. So this is verses 29 through 46. Um, the way that God delivered David, again, he's fighting actual wars, bloodshed, hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's a marshal in this. He's wielding a sword, holding a shield. He's fighting literal guys. He's spilling literal blood. He could die at any moment in these battles. So that's the context. So the way that God bent the heavens and shook the earth and spewed forth fire and brimstone was in this way. God didn't come and save David out of the battle, but he came and helped David in the battle. Yes. All right. And that's the Christian life. We want God to save us and help us, but the way he's going to do that is probably not by taking us out of our trials and sufferings, but rather by strengthening us in them. And that's what he does with David here. So look what he says. Uh, I can run against a troop, so the whole battle line. David's running against them himself. By my God, I can leap over a wall. So he would jump over these defense walls. Maybe it's the first line of the troops that he was able to leap over. So God gave David physical prowess here in order to outmaneuver his enemies. Boom, that's what he's doing here. Um, he's worshiping God through this section as well. There's no one like him that can strengthen David to fight in a supernatural way. Yes. And that's what he's doing. And that's what our lives are. Um, he made my feet like the feet of a deer. So that's the life verse for the Milwaukee Bucks right there. I'm feeling that. <laughs> Deers are quick. You're not going to chase them joints down. You need your arrow or your rifle. But David's quick on his toes because of God. He's able to get in, get out, boom. And he's, he's got that. Um, he trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze, a strong weapon that he was able to maneuver, strong enough and skilled enough to use. God equipped him to do that. God works with the way his world is. So he's going to strengthen David to fight in the ways of warfare. And not do, you know, he's not going to just uh, take him out of that. He's going to help him in it. Amen. And so David fought by faith. When he's out there battling in the midst of that, he's doing it by faith. He's looking to God. He's sending up prayers. And he's finding himself amazed at his abilities on the battlefield because God equipped him. So, pretty great. Um, there's a little note in here I love. Verse 36. This is this is so, so sweet here. You've given me the shield of your salvation, and your gentleness made me great. Um, thinking about like parenting, when we think about our children and raising them up, um, especially like as fathers, we want to be tough on our children, especially our sons. We want to be tough on them, and we want them to be hardy and be able to face the cold bitterness of this world and to be strong men that can carry, bur carry burdens. We want all that. But I think as fathers, we need to remember this is amazing here. What made David strong and great and mighty and free and advance, to advance such a way was actually God's gentleness. Yes. Because David knew God wasn't going to leave him, God was always there for him. And when David would stumble, God would gently help him. When he would call to God, he would gently answer and help him along his way. That's what made him great. That will help us in our parenting or in our discipleship or the way we treat our friends and even ourselves Amen. to reflect the gentleness of God. You know, it's counterintuitive. You think if you want something done and you want to do it right, you've got to be harsh and mean about it. It's not really the case. God works in ways that are above how we think. So the gentleness makes us great. Isn't that great, beloved? What will cause us to be faithful Christians 
is God's gentleness that He doesn't change. He's with us. He's going to be He's going to be merciful to us when we stumble, when we fall, which we will. He's not going to leave. He's not going to forsake. He's there, strong and gentle. Um, yo, I got to get cooking. Um, he, he, he destroyed them utterly. He pursued them, destroyed them. He didn't turn back. He crushed them into dust. They were all under his feet. And nations around him, whom he didn't even know, came to serve him. The Gentiles are coming to serve God's king here. So it's just complete victory. And that literally happened in David's life. So he's, that's what happened. Um, and even, even in the quarrels among his own people, God was with him. Um, it says in verse 44, you delivered me from strife with my people. So it's strife within, strife without. Saul was one of God's people, and there's people within, like his own son, Absalom, and those who followed him. God delivered him out of that inward strife too. So rejected by the Jews and also embraced by the Gentiles. Strong Christ notes here about what Jesus did, and we'll get to that. Um, okay, now final section, the outro. There's no justice here, all right? So it just can't be done in this amount of time. Verses 47 through 51. He reflects again on everything God is to him as he brings this remembrance to a close. The Lord lives. David knows that. He knows God is alive because he's helped him. He's heard his prayers. He's delivered him. He's been there for him. He's blessed, he's exalted, he's the rock of his salvation. He's given him vengeance against his foes and brought down all the peoples under him. And he finishes it in the last two verses, just reasoning this out because of this, because God was his helper every step of the way, he will praise God and he will sing praises to his name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed David's in a privileged position here because he's God's chosen. He's been anointed by God's Spirit to be his king to, uh, in Zion. And because he's king, God's king, then God's going to save the king. So just don't forget that about David. It's nothing apart from God saving him. That's what makes David different, is God is his helper. That's, and David knows that. Praise the Lord. Also here it says to David and his offspring forever. This would be the kings that would come later. And ultimately Christ is the offspring of David. And God delivered him too in his great strength and mercy. Okay, let's um, try to make some applications of this. We've got six of them here, so we'll try to cruise through them. First application, thanking God for what he's done for us is an expression of loving God. All right. Um, like I said, this Psalm 20, in the Psalm in verse chapter 22 here is almost identical to Psalm 18, almost. There's a few differences throughout. One of the main differences is Psalm 18 adds a verse at the very beginning that's not in this chapter. Psalm 18, verse 1 says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Yes. And then the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. As Christians, I think we struggle sometimes. Do I really love God? That can, you know, if I really loved God, my life would look different. And that's true. Sin wouldn't have the power over us if we loved God like we ought to or like one day we will. Yes, that's true. But that doesn't mean we don't really love Him. When you think about all the things God has done for you and you turn to Him and you thank Him for them, that is the expression of loving God. If you're sensible that God has helped you, that He's heard your prayers, that He's answered your prayers, if you can think of one example of God answering your prayer, and you're thankful for that, you love God. Amen. You have that love in your heart. It can grow. It needs to grow for all of us, but it is there. Yes. So just parking on God saving us from our sins, and we're encouraged by that, and we're blessed by that, and that stirs up gratitude in your heart, that's a sign or a proof that you do love God. And that's encouraging to be able to say, I do love the Lord. I don't love Him perfectly. I don't love Him like, I, I don't love him like He deserves. But I do love Him. Praise His name. And I will love Him more and more unto eternity. 
Second application, there's an epicness in all that God does for us. So the way God, David described God saving him is like mythological. It's rowdy. Um, but literally, it just looked like helping him on the battlefield. Now, that sounds... You know, that's, that's, that's um, crazy to us. We don't fight wars like that. None of us are in that right now. Uh, but for David, there's a way in which I was another day on the job. That was what he did. And so when we think about God helping us, strengthening us in life, it's going to come in those ordinary ways of our everyday life. Lord, help me to serve you today. Help me to honor you at work or in this difficult situation at home. Help me to, to do what's right and to serve you. When God does help us do those things, it's totally epic, yo. It doesn't feel that way. It doesn't look that way. But spiritually, it is that. In the heavenly realm, it is that. God steps down to help us through. And so all those prayers for God, even the little prayers for God's help, yo, there's rowdiness there. He, he responds no less than he did to David. He loves us with the same love he loves David with. Because he loves David because of Christ anyway. And the same with us. So, when the Lord helps us in everyday life, and that's the hardest thing, right? right? To press on over the weeks, months, and years of the mundane. Yes. And that's how He strengthens us. And that's the real supernatural life there, when God equips you to do that. Alright, third application. Just to note the joy of having a clean conscience. So David, this part here where he says God delivered him because his hands were clean, he knows he's not sinless, but he knows that his head's in the right place as far as his struggles. He doesn't want to kill Saul. He wants to love Saul. That's his, he's in the right place there. And so David here has the joy of having a clean conscience. It doesn't mean we're perfect. You, know, you don't have to be perfect to have a clean conscience, and none of us would. But when you think about difficult situations in life, we want to seek the Lord that He can help us to get our ducks in a row, to be doing the right thing, to be feeling the right things towards difficult people in our lives or situations that we're frustrated with. If we can get our hearts right and really seek what's right and what's best, we can have the peace and gladness of having that clean conscience. What that clean conscience does for you just chills you out because you realize, okay, whether it's now or in the distant future, God will vindicate me. The time will come when my clean hands will be vindicated. David's being slandered by Saul. Saul, David wants to kill me. David just wants the crown. All oh, this is not true. And David knew that in due time, God would bring the truth out. So as you struggle in life, with difficult people, difficult situations. If you keep your heart in that place, it will keep you at peace because you know that sooner or later, and it's not just in eternity, a lot of times he does it in his life, he will vindicate yes. and he will prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And that's a blessing. Amen. Uh, f fourth application. Yeah, this is wild. Um, <laughs> Let us serve God in all we do. This is sort of like the other one, but the realm in which you serve God, the realm in which you fight your battles is your everyday life. That's what it is. Your home life, your work life, extracurricular life, your life. And it doesn't seem epic and it doesn't seem crazy and our lives are peaceful and looking on the outside, it would probably be a boring story for most of us. But for us who are living it, it's real. And sometimes you can think, I'm not really, if I was really serving God, my life would be way wilder. It would be more exciting, more exhilarating, there'd be more highs, you know, a victory. That's not how it is. It's the mundane, it's the everyday, and in that, God's supernatural strength helps us. So be encouraged in that. God has you where you are. Serve Him where you are, and He will bless that path ahead. Fifth application. Um, we are the saved offspring of David. So, like Paul says in the New Testament about Abraham, he says, everyone who trusts God with the faith that Abraham had is Abraham's true offspring. We are the true children of Abraham because Abraham was the believer. So all believers are his true descendants. The same thing is true here of David. But it's not so much David's faith that's emphasized. It's that David is the saved one. David's passive in this. God saves David, and he saves all the offspring of David as well. And that includes us. 
We may not be kings and rulers in Judah and Israel, but we are kings and queens with Christ. We do reign with Christ even now. We partake of his royalty even now. And we are those protected offspring. And we can say about every Christian, God save the king, God save the queen. He's with us, and he will help us in those ways. So that's all we are. Now, that's not pretty. That's not like a life that can make you feel good about yourself all the time because you're really not able to do anything. But it will give you joy if you can let go and let God do all that for you and be your savior and be your deliverer. The better in tune we are with that, the better things will go. That's what he wants from us. God wants us. To trust Him, call upon Him for help, and be delivered by Him. That's amazing. He wants to save. Yes. So, our last application. We're going to be out of here. Um, just considering Christ the psalmist. So, in this psalm, in, in, in David's psalms, there's so much of Christ in them. And in the psalms, it's unique. It's not just telling us about Christ, what He will do, but it's really Christ speaking through David. The, the Psalms are the organ of Christ where he expresses his sufferings and trials in this life. Our Savior lived in this same way, even though he does save us and he is mighty in holiness and righteousness. But all the days of his life, he was saved by God. Hebrews says he made strong prayers unto God who was able to save him. And so Christ is the delivered one in his life. He had strong, mighty enemies around him. People were always trying to kill him. But God saved him, delivered him until that time when it was time his hour had come. And even in that, God saved him through that. And he did that righteously. He did that as an act of worship unto the Lord, even as he was rejected by the Father. And so this same thing is in Christ. The, the God-man in his humanity, that he relied upon God in that way. And in the same way, we can rely upon him. Uh, but somebody wrote a note here about the psalm here. Here in this psalm is prophesied the passion, resurrection, ascension of Christ, his rejection by the Jews, and the calling of the Gentiles. There's a pattern here of Christ's suffering, rejection, calling upon God, and ultimate victory across the nations. And, and that's what we are here today, beloved. Just some fruit of that, what he's done in calling us to worship him here today. And he's doing that across the globe. So he's worthy of trust, and he's worthy of praise. Amen. And so let's pray together. Amen. Father, please help us to rest in your amazing salvation. To be able to say with David, You are my strength, my shield, my fortress, my rock. And that your gentleness makes us great. Please help us now to trust you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.